They say we were made in God's image. I believe it. Our achievements surpass imagination. Our creations marveled. But our hearts are not pure. So, in the pursuit of greatness, we built our empires upon death and suffering. But the world we shaped could never last. In the end, we brought wrath upon ourselves to cleanse the corruption. And I was there. And the skies opened and fire rained down from the heavens. I witnessed a new leader rise from the ashes, promising peace. But only death came. Now, as the world wages war, I hide as the innocent are slaughtered. But there were those that knew these days were coming, speaking of prophecies and signs. We will be moving toward a one world government. Maybe that's why I'm still here. To warn you how the world really ends. This may be a lot to take in. But for me, the world has already ended. Well, the world you know, anyway. I remember the whispers about new world orders and the end of days. Of course, who could believe in such nonsense? Or so I thought. The world wanted change. It wanted a new age of peace. Who knew that this pursuit would usher in the very things we feared the most? Now, everything I loved is gone, and I am left with one purpose. To deliver a message. To testify to the truth. I know. Just telling you isn't enough. It never was. Truth. Who was it that once asked, what is truth, as it stood before him? Nothing ever changes. So, I'll tell you what your future holds, and I'll do my best to prove it is the truth. Not long ago, where you are now, there was a message, a warning that still haunts me to this day. More should have listened. This is how it began. How will the world end? This very debate has been saturated by endless views and opinions, consumed within a sea of noise. For some, the topic is nonsensical. For others, the answer is clear, as millions look to ancient biblical prophecy as the answer to what lies in wait for humankind's fate. Regardless of what you believe, the very debate has seen a resurgence due to unprecedented global conflicts and instability. With this, however, 
comes new claims that the long-awaited convergence of prophesied events destined to trigger the end of our age is not only entirely real, but have finally begun. Most people agree the world as we know it will come to an end one day, just not in their lifetime. And even if the end was near, it could never be proven, right? So why is it that millions of people all over the world still insist that the end is upon us? Are they naive or misled by skewed religious views? Or is there a deeper understanding whispers of truth that have been buried in this generation that are so profound it would change the way we understand everything. But even if such evidence existed, its warnings will likely fall on deaf ears. Often, when one hears about biblical prophecy or the end of days, as it is found within ancient scriptures, such as the Book of Revelation or the Dead Sea Scrolls, many already have deeply ingrained preconceived notions. After all, haven't we heard all this before? Anything new would no doubt just be another claim regarding some astrological event or rare date as a harbinger for the end. And it's not difficult to see why so many have this perception, as endless streams of information and media are absorbed into a desensitized and instant gratification society. News organizations and corporations compete to capture greater market share through sensationalized headlines and claims that result in complex topics being broken down into eight-second explanations, replacing genuine prophetic discussions to viral-worthy predictive claims that often look like this. Nations begin a new arms race in preparation for global nuclear war. Prophecy experts point to a celestial sign as the harbinger for the end. Beginning of the end. Survival bunkers are now big business as preppers say the end. Save the experts say that a solar flare will bring down the grid. Ending life as Genesis we know. report that a massive radiation. Millions prepare for Y2K. Y2K. This computer bug will collapse. A Breaking news from final clips could trigger the beginning of the, the end. The global pandemic is at an all-time high. Collapse society. Astrophysicists discover planet X, which some say will... Millions look to the sky. Dire implications from... The Mayan calendar predicts the world will end in 2012. Up next, how to make apocalypse puppy cookies. The Mayan prophecies, obviously, 2012, the world didn't end. So you look at these things and they're so vague and so general, a lot like um, astrology charts. And there's the problem. The endless stream of claims that have been ingrained into the minds of the public as billions watch predicted events and dates come and go, yet life marches on as usual. And then there are claims from infamous individuals such as Nostradamus, a French apothecary that lived during the 15th century, that many today attribute credit for predicting the rise of Hitler Surely he lends some form of credibility to the idea of genuine prophecy. At the very least, the same level of credibility that popularized much of biblical prophecy, right? Actually, most experts disagree. In any, or let's say Nostradamus, for example. He speaks in very broad generalities of you know, things that are going to happen. You know, I could say the same thing, you know, in the future some man's going to rise up and he's going to have all this incredible power and he'll do this and that. And if I get, you know, 50% close, which odds are probably pretty good, you say, oh, well, see, he, he prophesied that. But the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible gives you specifics about what's going to happen. You know, there's a lot of prophecies that are out there. There's the Mayan prophecy, there's Nostradamus. And uh, there's prophecies about dead popes. There's all types of prophecies that are out there. What makes biblical prophecies so different is their accuracy. 
that we find them in the Bible. What's interesting about this and teaching on Bible prophecy is you're able to find out some things. Many of the prophecies have already come to be. And when we look at the predictions and the, or the so-called prophecies of these other religions, sure, you can have a prediction here, a prediction there, one out of a hundred, two out of a hundred, maybe three out of a hundred. And that's the amazing thing about biblical prophecy is that biblical prophecy is something that you can actually study scientifically. It's actually called eschatology, where what the Bible has claimed to be prophetic, in fact, 27% of the Bible is prophetic, that the claims that it makes, do they come to pass? Is it true what the Bible has to say? So, is it? What is the difference between the predictions that have come and gone without fulfillment versus what has been foretold in the ancient biblical scriptures? Non-biblical predictions, which is what most are familiar with, are often made by individuals with heightened public attention due to their sensational and simplified approach to claims regarding a specific approaching date or signs in the cosmos. In addition to the previous examples, there were also those that believed the world would end during the turn of the 19th century. And yet again, just a few years later, in the year 1910, with the appearance of Halley's Comet, that was publicized as a divine signal for the end of the world. But does any of this have anything to do with biblical prophecy? Actually, no. Unlike the countless vague predictions made throughout recent centuries, biblical prophecy contains an unprecedented and complex tapestry of interwoven chronological events and details that present the complete timeline of humankind from the beginning to the end. In fact, the complete ancient scriptures contain over 2,500 prophetic details which were recorded over a millennium by 40 separate authors. In fact, the records are so complete, it's the longest running contiguous record of human history in existence and as a result, continues to be studied by universities and independent researchers all over the world. Unlike any other record, the scriptures precede and survived through the rise and fall of countless civilizations, including the ancient Babylonians, Egyptian, and Roman empires. As astounding as the preservation of the records throughout the ages may have been, it also continues to be proven shockingly accurate as archaeologists continue to uncover newly discovered ancient ruins throughout the Middle East along with hundreds of thousands of artifacts that directly support biblical history and fulfilled prophetic events. With all the prophecies that came true regarding the past, we can go all the way back to the book of Genesis and we can see the development of the nation of Israel over the centuries. You have prophecies regarding Egypt. You have predictions regarding these various things that happened in the book of Daniel. You have the prophecies regarding the Greek empire and the Roman Empire that came to be. And man, they were fulfilled with 100% accuracy. All of them were. Just one example of how accurately chilling the events within the prophetic timeline are. We can look to a warning about how just one city in particular, the city of Tyre, would be utterly destroyed by Alexander the Great recorded 200 years before it was fulfilled in the greatest of detail. The whole city would be so destroyed that it would be down to the very dust and that he would throw all the rocks into the sea. Now if you know the history of Tyre a little bit, you know that King Nebuchadnezzar came and he began to siege the city. But what happened is, in the meantime, while King Nebuchadnezzar was outside attacking the city, the people of Tyre decided that the only option they had was to move their whole city to a little island off the coast, until finally, when they just gave up the city, Nebuchadnezzar got through and everything was gone. Everything of value was gone. Now, if you are a soldier of the ancient world, one of the reasons you're fighting, uh, it's not for the, the fatherland or something, 
you want to get those those uh, gold plates and all the, the wonderful things that are in that city, that is your payoff. So Nebuchadnezzar left that feeling very frustrated. But what happened is years later, Alexander the Great came and he attacked Tyre. And of course they would not capitulate. And so he took the stones that had been left in ruins from the, the city on the mainland. He took all those and he threw them into the, into the sea to build a causeway so that Alexander the Great could then go and conquer the sea. Not only did every detail come to pass as it was foretold, but secular history confirms the entirety of this event as the prophecy was fulfilled in July of 332 BC. You know, this is something that's very specific talking about what's going to happen to a very a particular city in a particular way. It's not just this broad generality of what, you know, might happen, you know, where kind of anybody can make up these, these broad prophecies. The details surrounding how the destruction of Tyre came to pass is not the exception throughout the ancient prophetic timeline, but rather the rule. But even this is only the tip of the iceberg. The complete prophetic timeline is so detailed and complex in structure that the passing of many events rely on previous prophecies coming to pass first. Like a row of dominoes, if just one event in the timeline doesn't come to pass, the entire chronological and future sequence of events and fulfillments would completely fall apart. In this aspect, there is no other record like this in existence anywhere in the world. But to understand what this all has to do with us today and the end of the world, we first have to follow the timeline through one of the most researched and astounding sequences of prophesied events that history indisputably confirms came to pass, which still sends shockwaves throughout global culture and political landscapes today. A sequence that began around 2,000 years ago, when Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth. Based on historical records, Jesus' birth and life is believed by various researchers to have fulfilled upwards of over 300 prophetic events and descriptions from the Old Testament records some of which were recorded hundreds to thousands of years before Jesus first walked in Jerusalem. Even the details surrounding how he would be executed were foretold in the prophetic timeline around 400 years before crucifixions were even invented. It was during Jesus' time in Jerusalem that his disciples came to him and asked about the end of the age. They knew that if he was who he truly claimed to be, the prophesied Messiah, then he could tell them exactly what was going to happen to the empires of the earth, including Israel itself. And according to the ancient records, Jesus answered them in shocking detail. He has told us things that are going to take place at the end of days, at the end of this age. In fact, the disciples, when they asked Jesus about what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And he goes through and he starts to tell them all of these different things to look for. And what Jesus foretold was not what they wanted to hear. When Jesus was in Jerusalem, Jesus did not talk to the people about the empire growing, the nation ruling the world. In fact, one of the most frightening things that Jesus said to the Jews was not only that the destruction of the temple would happen, but that the Israeli nation would cease to exist. It would be scattered and destroyed. Not only did Jesus provide details regarding the end of the world, speaking of concepts and global change taking place in the far future, but he also warned of events that would happen much sooner to the nation of Israel itself. He foretold of the complete destruction of Israel and the dispersal of the Jewish people to the four corners of the earth. A terrifying warning that most believed would surely never come to pass. 
But almost 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion in 70 AD, the prophecy was fulfilled exactly as he said it would be. The nation of Israel fell by an invading Roman army led by the future Emperor Titus. The Jewish temple in Jerusalem, a massive structure over 40 acres in size, was completely destroyed so that no two stones laid upon another, just as Jesus foretold and more than one million Jews were slaughtered during the siege of the city. The small surviving remnant of the Jewish people were dispersed to the four corners of the earth. The nation of Israel was so decimated by military force that for all practical purpose, the Jewish bloodline was considered virtually dead. But following the structural rules of the prophetic timeline, there was much more to this prophecy. Decades before the destruction of Israel came to pass, it was also foretold that long after Israel would fall in the future, through utter destruction and displacement, the people would later be regathered into the original land and the nation would be reborn. In fact, Jesus himself, who often spoke in parables, gave such an example through the imagery of a dead fig tree coming back to life at the beginning of the end of days. Well, there's a prophecy that Jesus gave. He says, learn the parable of the fig tree. And he talks about how this fig tree, when you see it begin to blossom, that will be the generation that sees his return. A very, very significant statement. Most Bible scholars believe that imagery in the parable of the fig tree is symbolic of Israel. So Jesus himself is saying, when you see that fig tree budding, coming back to life, know that my return is near. So understanding that the fig tree that Jesus was talking about is in fact Israel. And they say when it comes back, then it will be the last days, it will be the days of Antichrist. Prophecy foretells that the end of days would begin with the rebirth of Israel. But of course, this event could never happen if the nation and people were not decimated in the first place, presenting more compounding evidence as to the complexity of the ancient prophecies. But if this sequence of events wasn't miraculous enough on its own, additional prophetic details regarding how the rebirth would be fulfilled is something that would leave anyone speechless. Uh, in Ezekiel 37, you have the Valley of the Dry Bones, this picture of all these bones of the Jewish people that have been scattered and separated, coming back together together as a nation. We also have uh, the prophecy in Isaiah that talks about how uh, Isaiah is startled to be told that somehow will a nation be born in a single day, asking how does that happen? How do nations just be born in a single day? As if the prospect that a decimated nation with a remnant scattered to the four corners of the earth could be reborn wasn't hard enough to believe, prophecies recorded over 2,000 years ago clearly foretold that this rebirth would occur in a single day. A seemingly optimistic view to say the least, but surely one that could never come to pass as something of this nature has never happened in the history of the world. There has been no country in the history of the world that has ever been completely destroyed, scattered among all the other populations of the planet, and then reborn in their original homeland, with their original language, with their original heritage intact. But after 1800 years, the impossible happened. On May 14, 1948, after the Holocaust and the end of World War II, the nation of Israel was reborn and the Jewish people once again had a land to call home. The action was ordered by the United Nations and was the first and only time the UN had created a new state by way of a General Assembly vote. We want to see the time come when we can do the things in peace that we have been able to do in war. If we can put this... So what we find is in 1948, May 14th, Israel becomes a nation again. This is unheard of. Never has a nation been out of its land for about uh, 1,800 years and then comes back 
as a people group. It just doesn't happen. They, they become assimilated and they become part of the rest of, of the world. But as miraculous as this event was, this is far from the happy conclusion one might expect and is merely a milestone within the prophetic timeline that continues on through the end of days, foretold as a sign for things to come. I believe the greatest sign uh, of our time is the rebirth of the Jewish nation. Um, the last time that there was such a thing as Israel, uh, Jesus Christ himself was walking on the earth and um, there are many prophecies that, that talk about in the latter years and in the latter days, God would regather his people from the four corners of the world. The prophecies warn that when Israel is reborn, all of the remaining events within the scriptural timeline will come to pass during what is described as the last generation. There's a lot of Bible prophecy teachers that believe the generation that saw the rebirth of Israel based on the illustration of the fig tree. They believe that those who see the, the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948, then it's that generation of people who will see the second coming of Christ. What's interesting about Psalm 102, uh, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall return in his glory. Well, Zion is a spiritual name for Jerusalem. Jerusalem is being rebuilt right now. And the Lord says he's going to appear in his glory as Jerusalem is being reestablished and rebuilt. And he says, this will be written for the generation to come. And that Hebrew word uh, that is used and translated into English, uh, to come, means the last generation, means the end or the terminal generation. So according to the prophetic timeline, our final hours have already begun, triggered by the rebirth of a nation that is quickly becoming a focal point for global conflict. So I say this generation will by no means pass away until all these things are fulfilled. And that is why we look to Israel as a major sign that we're in the last days. So. If, for example, if the definition of the last generation is a person born on May 14th, 1948, all of these remaining prophecies will be fulfilled before the end of that person's lifetime. So how long is a generation? This is one of the more debated topics in eschatology amongst researchers which see ancient prophecy define a generation in the last days as being around 80 years and in some examples as long as 120 years. Surprisingly, though the scriptures were written thousands of years ago, these time frames for a generation appear to coincide with exactly what modern medical science defines as one's average to maximum lifespan today something that was not always the case. For example, only a few hundred years ago, during the medieval age, the average lifespan was only around 35 years. What we do see developing is Israel is definitely a nation again. And, and that is really the key. I, I don't believe it's necessary to go into a, a position of, well, it's 80 years or 20 years or 40 years from 1948 or 100 years. It's just understanding that we are in the last days because Israel is a nation again. God is gathering the Jews back from the north, the south, the east, and the west. So if we are indeed living in the last generation as prophecy claims, then it stands to reason that we are far closer to the end of the world as most people would want to believe. There are about 500 future prophecies that are coming together. We are looking for these prophecies to be fulfilled essentially in our lifetime because we are in the last generation. In fact, we're nearing the end of that last generation. So we should start to see the convergence of these prophecies right now happening around the world in front of us. And it wasn't until Israel became a nation in 1948 that many of these things could even take place. If you were to line up a row of dominoes, Israel is that first piece it's that first trigger that allows all the other prophecies of Scripture to take place. 
of the estimated 2,500 prophecies contained within the ancient biblical timeline, only 500 of them remain to be fulfilled. So what exactly do they foretell? These final prophecies provide a sequence of specific events foretelling of an unprecedented union of world relations and economic systems that will give rise to a new authority with influence over all global affairs. But as soon as the world achieves this new union and declares peace and safety, humankind will be on the brink of chaos and unprecedented natural events that will usher in a period of death and destruction that is foretold to end two-thirds of the global population. So if we are truly approaching the end of the age, then there should be evidence that the remaining prophesied events are converging to fulfillment right before our very eyes, foreshadowing a perfect storm of global change unlike any other time in history. So has this convergence already begun? Does the foundation for unprecedented global change truly already exist? The remaining prophecies within the ancient timeline foretell of multiple layers of events that converge to trigger what is often referred to as the tribulation period or the end of days. The first layer of converging global change is the beginning of wars and rumors of wars that result in peace being removed from the earth. Jesus is giving signs that would indicate that his coming is near, his second coming. One of those is, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, uh, but that is not yet the end. He went on to say there shall be nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. But that particular expression, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, is actually a, a Hebrew idiom, and it means world war. Jesus said world wars will be the sign of the beginning of the end. And there's going to be some very large wars that are going to be happening on a mass scale. We, we recognize biblically this is the way that things are going. We're not talking about isolated skirmishes. We're talking about wars on a global level, many, many wars scattered throughout the world so that the whole world is essentially at war, and rumors of many other wars that will be starting. We're starting to see more wars now and more rumors of wars starting around the world than any other time. In fact, many of the conflicts we see today are associated with the spread of global terrorism and the threat of attack that could potentially take place in any nation at any time. Unlike regional wars, this new growing threat now affects nearly every person on Earth and in many aspects directly relates to the unprecedented concept of humankind living in a state where peace is dissipating from our societies and being replaced by fear. The more uh, these, these radical terrorists spread around the world, the more people are becoming afraid. I mean, TSA has security, massive security at all the airports. They're afraid that bombs are going to go off in elementary schools, in churches, in buses. And so the more this happens, the more peace is being removed. Things are getting worse, and we are beginning to see a global outcry for the governments of the world to work together in order to provide peace and safety, foreshadowing the need for dramatic change. But often, change comes through necessity. And according to the sequence of remaining prophecies, that necessity is coming very soon. Is the world really coming to an end? That's what you want to know, right?
Or maybe you're just killing time. I hope not. That's the last thing you have. Everything you've seen so far is your past. Things you should already know. And those warnings about wars and rumors of wars. It's all true. Things changed quickly in those final years. There were so many conflicts in those days that people stopped keeping track. Peace was something that now existed only in our memories, replaced by illusions of progress. We were consumed by a blindness. Other generations might have noticed, but not us. Not the terminal generation. Conflict and change is what we were all born into. Isn't this normal? Isn't this just the way life is supposed to be? Even as the world began to spiral out of control, how could we have known that this was only the beginning of sorrows? Everything from this point on is your future. There is one foretold war in particular that may be the very catalyst that leads to a demand for that change. A conflict where the scriptures provide such overwhelming detail. It's as if the event was recorded by an eyewitness shockingly naming countries, describing political coalitions and reasons why the conflict will begin in the first place, and chillingly the fact that this conflict will last only one day. The additional details surrounding this future event is presented in such detail that it terrifies many theologians, not because of the horrific events surrounding this particular conflict, but rather because many believe the drums of war for the start of this conflict can already be heard. The details, written over 2,000 years ago, name Iran, Syria, Libya, and surprisingly Russia as coming together in the last days to attack Israel. Only a few decades ago, the scenarios surrounding this war stumped theologians as the idea of nations such as Russia allying with Iran to attack Israel appeared politically improbable, if not impossible. But in this last generation, things have changed. Russia, of course, has a very strong um, Islamic presence in its southern republics. And there are some who believe that it may just involve the southern republics of Russia, other Bible scholars believe it's Russia itself that will join Iran and some other countries involved in attacking Israel, one of those being Libya. What's interesting over the last couple of years since the uh, death of Muammar Gaddafi is Libya has also gone more Islamic and that you could see how an Islamic nation like that would be involved in an attack on Israel. Actually, in recent decades, Russia has increasingly embraced an anti-Western stand on many political and economic policies and continues to build new relations with the very nations listed in the scriptures, including Iran. In fact, Russia has even recently used Iranian military bases to launch airstrikes in the Middle East. The two nations are working together to build new Iranian nuclear power plants and centrifuges.
Russia is also known to have provided stockpiles of missiles and weapons to their numerous Islamic and anti-Israeli allies. This is definitely an alarming sequence of political events that many today could never have predicted. And yet, thousands of years ago, this was foretold to happen even before such common interests found amongst these allies, such as world views formed by Islam and the United Front to stand against the newly formed Israel even existed. Because of this, we can now easily see why nations such as Iran, Syria and Libya would be involved in this war. But why Russia? Though they do have a growing Islamic presence within the nation, it's clearly not as influential as we see within other Islamic states. Surprisingly though, the scriptures actually tell us why. Nations are set up exactly as God said they would be. The reason for the war is this leader in Russia who recognizes Israel has something. It's called plunder. Israel has something that the leader of Russia wants. And I believe, and I know many Bible prophecy teachers have believed this for, for a number of years, that's going to be related to energy. There seems to be a lot of truth in this. Recently, Israel discovered massive pockets of natural gas, a finding that could potentially shift economic power from Russia and several Islamic states in the region to Israel. Currently, we recognize that Russia supplies almost all of the gas for Europe. You know, the leader of Russia threatened, you know what, I'm going to shut off your gas supply this winter if you don't comply with me. But Israel now has discovered a massive gas supply, one of the largest the world has ever, has ever come across. And it appears that there are negotiations right now, Israel is in negotiations to possibly supply Europe through Cyprus. If that were to happen, if Israel were to start supplying Europe with gas. I could only imagine what the leader of Russia would do. Far-fetched? Not really. There have actually been times that Russia has indeed threatened to reduce or turn off gas supplies to various countries for political leverage. And history teaches that wars are often waged over natural resources, including when the United States invaded Iraq in the 1990s to gain greater control over oil production. In fact, not only could Israel's growing energy sector directly begin to affect the Russian economy, many Middle East nations, especially Iran, would see this as a direct threat to national security. So it stands to reason that a preemptive attack that involves Russian support in some form can easily come to fruition. But with all of the wars and rumors of wars occurring in these last days, why does the prophetic timeline emphasize this conflict in particular? What makes this war such a crucial piece to the end of day scenario? And the way it's described in scripture as happening in a single day, where this conflict is resolved in a single day. And the way Ezekiel 38 describes this battle with fire and brimstone destroying those who come against Israel, including those in the coastlands. And when this fire comes, you have the people who are coming against Israel instantly dropping their weapons. And this idea that it's instant death. seems to be speaking very much of a nuclear type of vaporization where people are being impacted by a nuclear blast. Uh, and so we very well may have the first instance of nuclear weapons being used in scripture. Nuclear war. An event that has never occurred between the Middle Eastern nations at any time in history. This conclusion by many eschatologists isn't as sensational as you may believe especially when considering what the scriptures describe as taking place after this war comes to an end. What's interesting is Ezekiel 38 is one of the few places in the Bible that describes the post-battle scenario where they are told to leave the bodies for seven months. No one is to touch the bodies for seven months and then the professionals are to come and gather the bodies. That there may be some type of nuclear contamination that's involved because of the types of the equipment and the, the, the um, 
fact that the people who come in to do the cleanup, they can't do the cleanup right away. That sounds very much like a WND manual for how you should treat uh, a biological nuclear weapon conflict. And that's not all. The place where at least one blast is foretold to occur, where bodies are left for seven months after the population is wiped out by instant death, is also named in the ancient scriptures. A place that is said will never be inhabited again. A city that prophecy states will become a heap of ruins. Damascus, Syria. We're looking at a time where today, Damascus is a city of well over a million people. Yet the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 17 verse 1 that there will come a time in the last days where it says something will happen in Damascus that it will render Damascus uninhabitable forever. It'll change the geopolitical situation uh, forever. It is not difficult to imagine the inevitable global outcry after such an event occurs breaking the proverbial straw to implement new policy changes that will prevent such an act from ever happening again. But even this is only the beginning of the end. While telltale signs for expanding wars and rumors of wars shake nations around the world, there is yet another layer of prophecy that is simultaneously converging before our eyes, one that already directly affects you. The global financial system. The stability of our systems is already a grave concern for most governments around the world and often supersedes the fears of any modern day war. After all, money is the one thing that truly controls every aspect of our world, including the ability to wage war and care for growing populations. So if wars and rumors of war wasn't dire enough, what the scriptures say regarding the world's economies during the last days is even worse. In various ancient records that make up the prophetic timeline, including those found within the book of Revelation and the Dead Sea Scrolls, it warns that when peace is removed from the earth, the last generation would witness global economic collapse. Prophetically, the scriptures do talk about the economic situation of the planet. Uh, what, what it essentially describes is a very, very dire situation where people can't even make enough money to buy a loaf of bread at the end of the day, where the economies all over the planet have collapsed. Everything revolves around the world's financial systems. A collapse in these systems would result in the loss of the quality of life so many have become accustomed to. When it comes down to it, most would agree, economic instability is a threat that far more people today fear than even the threat of radical terrorism. We're seeing a, uh, a gathering of nations uh, where economics is failing them. Uh, nations are in debt. Uh, currencies are failing. So this is a situation that we now start to see happening around the planet. The economies around the world are starting to falter. They're being artificially oystered by nations, printing tons and tons of money, not based on anything uh, that's substantial like gold, just based on the fact that we have promissory notes. The frightening truth is that the foundation and the financial structures of the world have been cracking for quite some time, and many believe that the indications for a global economic collapse have already begun. These are not isolated events, but foreshadow a future that many believe can no longer be avoided. But not only would the last generation experience global economic instability, decline, and eventual collapse, but that there would specifically come a day where the world economic systems would completely come crumbling down in a single day. In all of human history, there has never been a situation where it was even remotely possible to have a worldwide global collapse. Never mind that this collapse could happen globally on a single day. But today, with the advent of technology, 
through numbers, through computers, through transferring of funds. There's nothing tangible like it existed for thousands of years. This is the only time in the entire history of the world where we have had a single worldwide economy. In fact, even a few generations ago, this concept was considered ridiculous. For example, after World War II, when the United States was booming economically, Europe was still in a depression. Various countries and regions often went through periods of economic prosperity and decline that were mostly unrelated to the financial state of others. But today, everything has changed. We have now created the exact global financial system that the prophetic records foretold would exist in the last days. The creation of a single global economic system. And examples of just how the global economy will collapse can be seen right now. Well, you, you see a, a very minor example in our stock market and the NASDAQ and the Hong Kong exchanges so that when they have a a very bad day and say they drop, they plummet in one day. You see the ripple effect happening around the world and all the other markets. But imagine that's not just a small plunge of a few percent, but literally an absolute collapse. That ripple effect will happen all over the planet immediately in all the countries. And so that's the type of effect we're talking about. And that could not happen at any other time in human history. We see this in real world applications every so often. A market crashes and within 24 hours, that crash ripples across the world as each market opens until virtually all of the world's markets have plunged. And thanks to the modern day advent of instant global communication, this results in immediate global panic. The irony is that economically, it's the pursuit of global unity through technology that in the end will be our very downfall. So the world economy is very, very fragile, and it wouldn't take too much to upset that. Uh, it wouldn't take much for the stock market to collapse and the entire economy we know and the way it works to change. There are a number of people who want to be optimistic, who think that, you know, we can restructure economy, we can restructure job salaries, we can erase some of the debt. We are so far beyond that, it is not even conceivable that the debt can be repaid. Because of the amount of debt currently that exists worldwide, including the United States, and the revenues of all the people of those countries, economic collapse on a worldwide basis is absolutely inevitable. It, it really is inevitable. There is no, no possibility of it not happening. Wait, I have to tell you, I used to be just like the world. I was the world. Seeking the greatest pleasures and luxuries it had to offer. Immersed in the pursuit of endless celebration. distracting ourselves from the truth. That, for all the comforts the world has to offer, they last for only a moment. So we consume a distraction for each moment of our lives, hoping that somehow it can last forever. In truth, we despise the endless toil to fill our days, knowing that we can't stop the inevitable. So, what value is there in something that doesn't last? Even so, did what we all do. I covered up my fear with distraction. Oh yeah, 
The world markets did collapse, just as he said. And all of the dreams of success and luxuries we pursued began to pass away, replaced by bitterness. But, instead of seeing how it was our own hand that brought this upon ourselves, we blamed God for our suffering. But how can the world blame someone that they don't believe is there? That's probably why things got worse. And though the writing is on the wall for approaching global change, much of which appears to be caused by our own hand, there is yet another layer in the prophetic timeline that we are told will prove the last days are truly upon us. The convergence of natural catastrophic events unlike anything we've ever witnessed before. Regarding those specifics, for example, the Bible says there'll be signs in the heavens. In fact, in the context, the Bible says there'll be signs in the heavens and there will be times upon the earth, the oceans or the seas will be raging. The Bible says that men's hearts will begin to fail them for fear when they see these ominous things coming upon the earth. The context is profound. It is a quick succession of global events that are going to be cataclysmic. One thing that is talked about quite often and uh, misinterpreted quite often is the natural disasters that will happen in the end times. Arguably, one of the most commonly discussed natural sign in the end days is the dramatic increase of earthquakes around the world, something that in geological time would be statistically unprecedented if it were actually happening during what many believe is the last generation that in the last days there'd be an, an increase in great earthquakes. Jesus used verbiage that means bigger earthquakes in unusual places. We're looking at things regarding, for example, greater hurricanes, greater typhoons, um, things that in nature you can sense that things are coming undone. And yet, if you looked at it naturally, you would say, well, this is due to global warming or this is due to, to man's bad stewardship of the earth. But yet the Bible said as we approached the end, this is exactly what we would see. Which, by the way, that preempts man's involvement. The scriptures do tell us that earthquakes, specifically earthquakes, will increase in frequency and in intensity. Now, it describes the, the pattern of earthquakes as labor pains. Um, but the idea here is when they're describing these various birth pains, uh, a lot of it has to do with natural disaster type events like earthquakes uh, and wars and famine. Uh, and we've always had these things. So people ask, well, how is now any different than before? What you do have is, as with birth pains, is you have an increase in the frequency and in the severity at the same time as these are increasing. Uh, in intensity and frequency, you have the convergence of other events. And so you see we have all these things coming together at the same time. But wait a minute. Hasn't the U.S. Geological Survey, or USGS, gone on record to state that this is not occurring, that no such increase in earthquakes have been detected around the world? Because this is such a debated topic, the USGS gave a press release saying that this was not occurring. As a result, we actually decided to take the USGS data, millions of data points, spent months downloading it, analyzing it, graphing it, studying it. The results were absolutely terrifying. Despite what you may have heard in the past, this is the compiled data from the USGS from over the last 100 years. Keep in mind, that we're not talking about the millions of micro tremors that can now be detected from the distribution of more numerous and sensitive sensors, but strictly data from the larger earthquakes that can be felt by people beginning at 6.3 and up on the Richter scale that could be easily detected by early 19th century sensors 
from virtually anywhere in the world. This data shows what the USGS and other organizations do not want you to see. It shows that the earthquakes are increasing in intensity and they are increasing in frequency. This is exactly the description that was prophesied. I don't believe the USGS was intentionally lying to the public. I think they are in denial of their own data. In fact, in recent years, some seismologists have even come forward to admit that in truth, there is indeed an increase in large earthquakes globally, and even revealed cases where big earthquakes are believed to have triggered additional quakes. However, many felt there was not enough of a concern to present this data through official public releases. But there is reason for concern, and even prophetic details within the scriptures insinuating that this very occurrence is the catalyst for even more unprecedented heavenly signs and events to come. Mainly, prophecies in the end of days foretell that the stars would be darkened, the moon would turn red as blood, and the sun would become black as if it were covered by sackcloth. Unmistakable signs that would not be regional, but rather global in nature. But what I realized is that the moon turns blood red when you look at it through a filter of ash. And this has been well documented. And also, the sun looks like it's covered with sackcloth when it's covered with a layer of ash. So where do we see in Scripture an event that speaks about such a, a, a thing happening? Well, it's in Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 tells us that smoke will come out like the smoke out of a great furnace and that it's going to cover the sun and the moon and the stars. And with what one might expect from the details offered within the prophetic timeline, we are told exactly what causes these signs. Smoke that rises from the earth caused by an increase in earthquakes that trigger unprecedented volcanism. The, the earthquake data is a precursor to something that is even far more devastating. Isaiah talks about worldwide volcanism, volcanism that puts ash in the air. It's interesting when you hear scientists talk about the eruption of the Yellowstone, but it's just there, it's bubbling. They're saying it's not a question of if it's going to blow up, it's a question of when it's going to blow. And when that happens, that, it's, that so much ash will come out of it that it's going to cover all of North America. It will kind of be like a nuclear winter scenario. And so it'll, it'll cover it so much that the sun will be darkened. And of course, if you have ash up there and you look up at the moon, what's it going to look like? It's going to look blood red. So we actually have, we have observation. This is called science, right? When you observe something, we can observe what happens when the moon is, is it filtered by ash, it turns blood red. When the sun is filtered by ash, it looks like it's covered with sackcloth. And you look at the, but the stars, you can't see them because they're just not bright enough to come through that. You can look at the pictures of the volcanic eruptions that took place in Iceland, and you can see that the sun, it, it, it's really darkened. And in addition to the thousands of volcanoes all over the world that could potentially be triggered by an increase in magnitude and frequency of great earthquakes, the eruption of a supervolcano would also easily get the job done. And though researchers seem to place a lot of attention on the one located beneath Yellowstone National Park in the United States, it's not the only one. And not all supervolcanoes are on land either. In fact, there is another one that researchers are currently studying, and this one, named Tamu Massif, located in the Pacific Ocean, is currently the largest single volcano ever discovered on Earth. This underwater volcano is about the size of the state of New Mexico and was hiding right under our noses. What's concerning, though, is that not only are up to 90% of Earth's volcanoes believed to be located underwater, but most of them are still undiscovered. This leads to a high probability that other supervolcanoes, still unknown to researchers, are active and lurking in the depths of our oceans. 
The eruption of a supervolcano under the ocean is actually described in part of the prophetic timeline in Revelation. Now, if this happens, it will destroy a good percentage of the ocean's fish and wildlife. Chillingly, during the period of wars and rumors of war, economic instability and increased earthquakes, Revelation does indeed foretell of not only signs in the heavens and disasters on land, but also one that happens underwater that is so devastating it results in the death of one-third of all sea life in the oceans. Something that even researchers in various scientific fields agree could indeed occur with the eruption of an underwater supervolcano, as volcanic gas and debris will no doubt consist of massive amounts of toxic chemicals and sulfur dioxide, which is deadly to most sea life, especially as it travels with the ocean currents. So what we see in the last few hundred prophecies are several frameworks coming together. Based on the future prophetic timeline, we see that the world is going to be embraced in fear, peace is removed from the world. We see uh, global wars popping up all over the planet and rumors of even more wars. We see economic situations all over the planet where countries are starting to collapse where they will have to do something about it. We see uh, an increase in tectonic activity, earthquake activity around the planet. We see the precursors of all of these frameworks happening. But as all of the pieces of the prophetic puzzle converge, what is the grand picture? Where is all this leading? The prophetic timeline states that these unfolding events, the convergence of global conflicts, economic collapse, and unprecedented natural disasters, is not actually the end, but will rather complete the foundation necessary for a swift global change unlike any other time in history. Change that leads to the rise of a one-world government. Revelation talks about this idea that there is a type of global government uh, and we see in our world of instability where there's this desire to uh, link one another for safety, for security. When all of these things converge, the world will cry out for peace and safety. They will want to be protected. They will want economic freedom. They need a new world order. There's a, a sense in the world by many people that there are so many different areas currently spinning out of control. Um, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel uh, talked about how global chaos seems to be the new norm. In other words, there's this feeling of instability. And out of instability, people often want stability. Out of chaos comes order. And so people are looking for something to give that to them. Change often comes out of necessity, and the idea of a global government has actually been on the table for quite some time amongst world leaders, and the foundation for this new system already exists. The best example of this today is the United Nations, which was formed in 1945 as a response to World War II and the outcry to prevent such atrocities from ever happening again. It was believed that if the world can work together, we could end conflict and instability. An idea that to this very day, many leaders and elitists around the world take very seriously as the only long-term solution for humankind's survival. And the very concept has been changing the political landscape for decades, whether you know it or not. So the only solution, logical solution, is actually part of the prophetic timeline. It talks about a one world order or one world government. It doesn't mean that there's going to be one nation on earth. All the nations will still be there and, and, and all the presidents and all the cabinets will be there. However, there will be an overriding authority, an overriding law that will apply to every single nation. Think the idea is nothing more than a radical conspiracy theory. The system is already alive and well in the form of the European Union. Conceived and formed in the name of mainly financial stability, 
Many European countries have united together while retaining their own leaders, cultural influences and borders, however adopting a universal new currency to share amongst them. More importantly though, they created a new court system and authority that can supersede the will of each individual country. Not only is the formation of the UN and the EU the very embodiments of precisely what prophecy foretold would happen in the last days, but this model, in the name of peace, safety and stability, will eventually be applied on a global scale. And there's a sense that we're ready for it, whereas in the past we might have been more independent, more free, but now because of the world situation, we're willing to accept a new order, a new way of doing things. But if we are living in the last days, then there must be radical political change occurring right now. And surely, a superpower like the United States, which is heavily involved in world affairs, isn't partaking in such an agenda. If that's what you think, well, you would be wrong. One of the greatest overseeing authorities that you can have today is who controls the internet because whoever controls the internet controls and can limit what you say. Now, now, now keep in mind that almost all business transactions on the entire planet are internet based. So whoever controls the internet directly or indirectly controls the world's economy. So this is one step away from global financial control. The United States is often referred to as the father of the Internet, and since its inception in the late 1970s, the U.S. has virtually monopolized the development of all new web-based technologies, and for the most part, defines and controls the technology and laws that govern banking systems, financial transactions for all web and retail-based business, and permits freedom of speech, which is protected under the U.S. Constitution. One would think that a nation with such influence over the Internet would continue to retain as much control as possible. But through behind closed doors discussions between the U.S. government and outside influences, the United States has recently decided to give up that control to a private organization called ICANN, which most believe will be influenced by globally cooperating and overseeing authorities like the U.N and we have just handed all of our authority to another party. Why would the United States hand over that kind of control to another entity? It probably makes sense to the governments of the world. See, the governments, they look at our trends. They look at the financial problems. They look at everything from a global perspective. They look at nations, uh, economies going up and down. They see terror. They see all the problems that us people don't pay any attention to. It's more certain than not that they have already concluded a while back that there is no hope for all the individual nations of the world individually being sovereign. They must cooperate in order to solve these problems. So when we see that the United States has transferred all control over the internet, including all the financial information to another entity, it doesn't make sense to us, but it makes sense to the world authorities who are now merging because it can't be merged overnight. It's being merged in slow incremental values uh, so that in the end, it's a very easy transition for the average citizens on Earth to accept. But I believe this has been in the works for quite a while, but they're not doing it because it was prophesied. It was absolutely prophesied. They're doing it because it's the logical thing to do to take care of the citizens of Earth. And what of the freedoms of Americans regarding free speech on the Internet? Well, many believe a globally controlled Internet will, of course, result in a globally controlled standard of what one can and cannot say online. All in the name of global stability, of course. Essentially, what has happened is that the United States gave away the ability to control the, the free speech of the American citizens. This is, this is nothing but one step away of censorship where we could be, in the future, controlled by another authority. They will tell us what is allowed and what is not allowed. In other words, if, if your actual speech is no longer under the control of the laws of your country, it's moving toward a one world government. 
But is it really that surprising? The populations of the world have already been crying out for change. And change is exactly what we'll get. Uh, and so there's this desire, a readiness for change. And the Bible says that when that change happens, unfortunately it's not going to be good. There's going to be new power structures in the world, a new order of the way we do commerce, the way the political alignment of nations are. Those things are all going to change. And I think people are ready for it, but I don't think they're aware of what the eventual ramifications of those changes are. So what are those ramifications? After all, most people are beginning to believe that in theory, this should usher in a new age of equality and stability. So just as it was believed that the formation of the EU would end regional instability, doubling down on the rise of a new world order will also be perceived as the solution to worldwide peace. But according to the prophetic timeline, only now will the stage finally be set for the conclusion of prophecy and the fulfillment of our fate. This fate was never forced upon us. We chose it willingly. The one world government wasn't like what you would expect, but nothing ever is. There was no new United Earth flag or erased national borders. There was no evil government that enslaved or tracked the human race. Most of that we did to ourselves already. In reality, it was a unity that felt far more natural, like a global awakening that we were all in this together. In the name of stability, we created new unions and globally superseding laws that everyone believed would protect us. We believed that the only way to have a perfect world was to create it ourselves. But just as with attempts found within the pages of ancient history, our modern day Babel was destined to fail. I realized that despite what we hoped for or want to believe, the world is a prison and we are all sentenced to death. So, it was only after losing everything and everyone that I realized the world can't save me. It never could. But even amongst the darkness, there is a light. And it wasn't until I truly let my life go that I was able to find it. A way and a truth that finally set me free from these chains. But the world... Well, the world was still in bondage. So, the people sought to raise up a new hope that could save us all. But in truth, we were raising up death itself. With the foundation complete, Prophecy warns that the world will seek a new leader that can solve all of our problems. This person is described by many names throughout the scriptures, but you may know him best as the Antichrist. 
The Bible paints a picture of what the end times will be like in kind of these broad brush strokes that we will be moving toward a one world government. We see that eventually a band is going to rise up that the Bible calls the Antichrist. He's called the Beast. In the book of Daniel, he's called the Little Horn. He's got a number of different names. I believe that the world will uh, willingly and uh, happily embrace this man with the plan the man who's going to solve many of the world problems we see. Uh, and there's no shortage of problems to solve. Not too long ago, a spokesperson for the European Union said, we need a leader in the world to deliver us from these problems. It doesn't matter if that leader is a devil or a saint. That person went on to say, we need a leader. And isn't that an interesting statement? Because the Bible says, both Old and New Testament, that the world is going to cry out, listen to this, for peace and prosperity. That's what the world wants. The world wants peace and the world wants money. When we look at it biblically, we know that this man is going to come on the scene in a time when the world is in a place of great perplexity. And it appears that, that we are definitely approaching that place of great perplexity right now. In fact, the, the Antichrist isn't going to really come on the scene until there is catastrophe going on, disaster going on throughout the world and also when there really is a vacuum for world leadership. However, biblically, this is exactly how it's supposed to go. It may seem difficult to imagine a leader being voted in that will supersede all others, but history teaches us that in times of turmoil, drastic measures are often taken. Soon, the entire world will not only embrace this man coming to power, they will demand it. And his message will be such that everyone's going to hear what they need to hear. So again, all these things have been put into place, and we're going to see those executed rather quickly. The closer, you know, the closer we get to the time of the Antichrist, all these things are converging. Imagine if you could unite the world and make it equitable, uh, fair, just. Uh, I believe that many of the crises and wars will finally uh, pave the way for a savior to come and say, here's a way that man can actually evolve forward in unity, uh, in economic justice, in fairness, uh, in, in human rights for all people. It will sound so good, it will be irresistible. And even though the biblical timeline does foretell that this Antichrist indeed establishes new peace treaties in the Middle East with Israel, as well as implement new global solutions for increased stability, it's a short-lived time where peace and safety is all but an illusion. And then people can finally say, peace and safety. And when they start to begin, they start to say peace and safety, that is when sudden destruction will come upon them. The final few prophetic events within the timeline foretell that the Antichrist's true agenda will be unveiled within a few years of taking office, appearing to change laws and policies that, according to prophecy, the leaders of the East will no longer stand for. Revelation also describes a uh, time coming when there is a final climactic battle with the kings of the East marching towards uh, Israel to get involved in the conflict with the Antichrist at that time. What's interesting about the description of the kings of the East is it describes it as a 200 million man army. And really there's only two militaries in the entire world that can muster an army that large, both being in the East, one being India and the other being China. In fact, there was a Chinese general who boasted that it would be possible for them to raise an army and he quoted 200 million men that he could raise to fight in, a, in an upcoming war. And so we see that the population growth has also converged in our modern technology to allow such a large army uh, to actually march on Jerusalem. Whereas back then they might have thought maybe that's a figurative statement, not really 200 million. A chilling claim from China that an army of 200 million soldiers can be raised for war, as this is the precise number of soldiers ancient prophecy foretells will march from the east to wage war against the Antichrist and his coalition of nations in a conflict called Armageddon, a war to end all wars.
By the time things come to this, after years of economic collapse, famine, unprecedented natural disasters, the Bible claims that nearly three quarters of the world's population will have perished and our modern age will have truly come to an end. But today, even with the remaining 500 prophecies appearing to converge before our very eyes, most people are ignoring the warnings. You know, sometimes I look at my TV and I'm, I want to yell back at the commentator or the person that's on the TV trying to get his attention about his analysis of the world. But then I realize the media is just as blind as the culture that they're leading. If there was ever the statement, the blind leading the blind, it is a media driven world that's blind and the world that follows them is blind. And what do I mean by that? I, I don't want to sound mean. But there is a path that the world is taking that the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but that way ends in death. And then there's a path and a direction that God has set. I do see the world blindly being led by the blind. They have an agenda. According to their worldview, uh, serves a purpose. And for those who are permeated with that, look, uh, you can't compete with it. It's beautiful. It's got the right lighting. It's got the right sound. It's got the right hype. They honestly believe that what they have to offer is the answer. And that is, we can do this as humans. We can come together as one. We can create our own utopia, which is no new idea. We can cause our own republic to take place as a one world, man-centric governing empire and if we just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, uh, we can do this. And yet it's a modern day dress up of an ancient, ancient idea. And every one of those ideas have failed. It will always fail. Even today, it would be difficult for one to accurately predict the state of the world in just a few years from now, never mind several millennia into the future. And yet, beyond all odds, we are on the path to complete prophetic fulfillment as it was foretold within the biblical prophetic timeline over thousands of years ago. Like the disciples 2,000 years ago, we want to know what are the signs of the end of the age? What are the signs of Jesus' return? And Jesus replied with a number of signs to watch for, including false prophets, wars, earthquakes. But the most important thing he said that a lot of people miss is he said, when you see all these things happen, then look up, for your redemption draws nigh. And the real key to that passage is all these things. So when people ask, what is the number one sign we should be looking for to indicate the end of the age? It's convergence. Convergence of the signs that Jesus talked about. It's not just one sign or two signs, it's all of them. And as we look at the world around us, we are seeing the signs that Jesus talked about coming together in increasing frequency and increasing intensity. That is what makes our generation unique. Throughout history, there have always been regional wars, famines, and disasters. However, the convergence of prophetic events in the last generation make it clear that all of these things would not only be global in nature, but occur simultaneously, beginning after the rebirth of Israel, a scenario that has never existed before in the history of the world. Things have snowballed in such a way that, frankly, I never thought I would see it this way. Global economic peril, global border issues, global lawlessness, global threat of terrorism. The things that the Bible has warned about is coming to pass at the exact same time across the board. We are living in the time of the signs. It's quite amazing. We've never been at a time like this ever, ever before. What, what's exciting about where we are right now is this is the first generation in 2,000 years where you have a, a modern state of Israel that's been reborn. All of this is converging right now before our eyes. None of the Bible prophecies regarding the second coming of Christ really had a whole lot of validity in the, in the sense of they could be happening at any time until Israel became a nation again. And we see the convergence of all the other things, earthquakes, pestilence, famine, the convergence of all these things happening at the same time. 
and the world turning against Israel all at the same time, which is also very prophetic. All of these things are happening at the exact same time at a feverish pitch. I find that the most fascinating thing. Jesus gave every reason to believe. I mean, you think about it, what more could he possibly have done? I mean, what more could you possibly want? Even still, some may be thinking, if the convergence leading to the tribulation period and the second coming of Christ is happening now, as most theologians and eschatologists believe, then why is it that even many Christians are turning a blind eye to the coming convergence, claiming that we can't know the day or the hour? A commonly repeated phrase that actually comes from Jesus himself. He stated that nobody will know the day or the hour because of misinformation about prophecy in general. Most people will interpret that to mean, well, since we can't know how much time is left, what's the point of looking for any signs? But in fact, Christ was telling us to look for signs. It's not that you don't know the, the times and seasons. You know, when Paul mentions, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you're not to be ignorant. Uh, he's talking about that prophetic pattern of the signs, of the seasons, the feasts of the Lord. The Feasts of the Lord, or Divine Appointments. These are ancient prophetic dates or rehearsals that have been passed down through generations, and the feast dates overlay perfectly on the biblical prophetic timeline. The scriptures present seven feasts in total. The first four occur in the spring and foretold the first coming of the Messiah. For example, the first spring feast, known as Passover, prophesied the very day that the Messiah would be sacrificed. These feasts begin with Passover, but something very special happened on Passover. That was the day that Jesus was crucified. He fulfilled these feasts to the exact day. For example, for Passover, they would take a blameless, spotless lamb and they would uh, use that to sacrifice for their sins. And so all the symbolism wrapped up in the Passover sacrifice, Jesus fulfilled, even coming and presenting himself as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, said, Behold, the Lamb of God. He wasn't just speaking figuratively. There are four in the spring, and there are three that are in the fall. And what you find is a pattern here, that the first four in the spring were all fulfilled in the first coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But we are now on uh, the verge of the beginning and the fulfillment of the final three feasts. And this is where things become interesting. The remaining feasts, all taking place in the fall, appear to foretell the second coming of the Messiah during the last generation. And new ancient cultural discoveries surrounding the next feast to be fulfilled have been shaking the theological community. The next feast to be fulfilled is called the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah. What I find so amazing about the Feast of Trumpets is it's the day that nobody knows the day or the hour. They would count from the last new moon until the new new moon. But the new moon is this tiny little sliver in the sky. And you can only see it from about, say, 6 to maybe 10 o'clock at night. If you're not looking for it, you're going to miss it. If it's cloudy, you're not going to see it. There's all kinds of reasons that you would not see the new moon. So unless you can visually see it, you could not declare the new moon. But when two people saw it, two witnesses, they would then go to the leadership and once they decided, yep, we really do have the new moon, then they would declare that the Feast of Trumpets would begin. So when Jesus was answering the question, when are you returning? His answer was, nobody knows the day or the hour. He was literally saying, I am returning on the feast that you have been celebrating for 1,500 years that you yourselves call, nobody knows the day or the hour. So I agree, we can't know the exact day or the hour, but that phrase has been taken way out of context. 
So if this is indeed what Jesus meant, then are we destined to repeat the mistakes of our past, like those that were caught unaware during the first coming of Christ around 2,000 years ago? Will the last generation today also be blind to the signs and warnings that surround us? Jesus rebuked the Pharisees very sternly for not knowing the time of his visitation. So they should have known that. He says, look, you guys can read this, the, 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 the sky to see if it's going to rain tomorrow, but you don't know the time of my visitation. That's why I think it's important that we do take the prophecies very seriously. So at the end of the day, we come back to the original endless debate, and we are left with only one of two conclusions. First, that everything that has been unfolding up to this day is mere coincidence, a convergence of thousands of events across the interactions of billions of people over generations of time that are resulting in the fulfillment of the most astronomically defying odds in the history of the world. Or, the prophecies are true and originate from a divine source, a source that also promises eternal life to those that reject the world to follow a greater truth. So if the source of prophecy is indeed divine, then we may be missing the most basic point of all, the reason why biblical prophecy exists in the first place. The point of prophecy is for God to prove that he is God. There is comfort in knowing exactly what is happening as you see it unfolding. You don't have to be afraid because you know what's going to happen next. Jesus said, I've told you these things in advance that when they come to pass, you will know that I am he. And it's a wonderful thing to realize that God didn't give us Bible prophecy to scare us. He gave us Bible prophecy to prepare us. We get to know what's happening next and we have great hope. Hope. That's something people no longer have in my world. So few will understand how the convergence of things to come was never meant to cause death and suffering, but to end it. Like the generations and empires that came before us, we too believed the lie that we could make the world perfect. But how can perfection ever come from us? Our mistake was not realizing that what we seek could never be obtained in this life only in the one to come. Now that my time here finally comes to an end, I am no longer afraid. I have fulfilled my purpose. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race. And now, I will see the face of God.